So we got a couple of more King of the Rings to get through, so we're going to try and get through them over the next day or two. Yes, indeed. It's time to talk about King of the Ring 2000. Oh boy, a night for the ladies. <laughs> but more on that in a little bit. Uh, when you think back to WWF at this time in 2000, you know, it's, it's striking a couple of things. One, they were without Austin, obviously, because of the angle they did a Survivor Series the previous year where he got hit by the car because he had the neck problems and he needed some time away. So a guy that had meant so much to the company in 98 and 99 wasn't there, and yet you hardly noticed. Like, that's how hot shit was at this time. That's how hot this product was. That's how hot this company was, was the fact that your biggest star wasn't there and it's like you don't even notice like the level of talent at the top was amazing the level of talent at the middle and even at the lower levels was outstanding and you know at this time you can go back and you can certainly look at some of these matches and you say they're not ones that really hold up well especially to the discerning taste of the modern wrestling fan but again it's just a reminder of who gives a crap uh, give me interesting, compelling characters that do interesting, compelling things, and everything else seems to work out magnificently. Uh, but nonetheless, let's talk about King of the Ring 2000. I think it was in Boston, Massachusetts. And this was a year that you had the quarterfinal, semifinal, and final match all on the card. Some years you would just have semifinals and the finals. Other years you would have the quarters on there as well. Your quarterfinal matches were Kishi beat the Invisible Man by DQ. You had Val Venus with a young and oh, so beautiful Trish Stratus. Uh, taking on and defeating Eddie Guerrero, who had China. Like, that was a blast from the past, the old mamacita. <laughs> oh, man. Eddie Guerrero in China. Like, that was a thing back in 2000. It was awesome. Crash Holly defeated Bull Buchanan. Uh, that's an, also a trip back in time. To, speaking of wrestlers that are no longer with us, Crash Holly and just how over he was back in 2000. And then Kurt Angle defeating Chris Jericho in a pretty good match, which obviously isn't going to be the best match that these two could have ever had together because they only went about 10 minutes. But still, when you look at the quarterfinal matches, it was definitely really good stuff. Uh, you had a fatal four-way elimination match for the WWF Tag Team Championship. And listen to the teams that were in here. You had TNA with Trish Stratus. Oh, Trish. Uh, you had the Hardy Boys, you had Too Cool, Grandmaster Sex A, and Scotty Too Hotty, and then Edge and Christian. Like, the freaking, the freaking pose, the five-second pose. <laughs> fucking awesome, the Bill Buckner jersey. <laughs> but man, this tag team division used to be humming, didn't it? Holy crap. Uh, yeah, and this match was fun. You know, it was cool. Obviously not the best tag match in WWF that Nedge and Christian or the Hardy Boys have, but certainly pretty damn good. Um, always seems like when you go back in time, though, you look at all the notable shows, it always seems like Edge and Christian always seemed to go over at the end of the day, didn't they? Yeah, it, it, it did, definitely. Um, but man, going back and watching this to me, like I remember just how much fun Scotty Too Hotty and Grandmaster Sexay were and how much fun Too Cool was. And especially when you incorporated Rikishi. Holy shit, are you kidding me? Like, that was fun. Those were some fun-ass times, man. Then you got to the two King of the Rings semifinal matches. You had Rikishi defeat Val Venus. Even though Rikishi won, Val Venus attacked him after the match. Um, and, you know, injured Rikishi, if you will. And then you had Kurt Angle defeat Crash Holly in the other semifinal. That was kind of a short match, which again, when I talk about, you know, King of the Ring, you know, I've, I've come to the realization as I've been doing this review series that I look more fondly back on this pay-per-view and this pay-per-view series than I actually should because a lot of the matches weren't great. A lot of the matches were short because they were the tournament, um, but just an example sometimes of absence makes the heart grow fonder and, you know, historical bias creeping in. Um, I will say, ironically enough, though, I think that a concept like this actually would fit better into today's WWE because they don't care as much about characters. They don't care as much about stories. They've tried to set out to be a more well-produced indie fed. Well, what better way to make your indie fed wrestler shine than in a tournament where the only thing that matters is their fucking in-ring action? So, 
when I think about the King of the Ring and I say in the past, you know, this show wasn't always the greatest and historically it wasn't. When I think about it now, I think it actually could be one of their better pay-per-views that fans would really look forward to and really enjoy because again, they don't care about characters and stories anymore. And at least you could come out of the King of the Ring tournament if you had it in June, where you could set up some things that played out and uh, blew off at SummerSlam. So, yeah, like it would work better now, I think, than it did back then. Although we used to really look forward to the King of the Ring show because there was still something to be said about King of the Ring and, you know, who was going to win and who they're going to anoint is kind of like that next man up. Like that was very appealing. Um, <laughs> But before you got there, <laughs> Pat Patterson and Gerald Briscoe <laughs> and the hardcore evening gown match for the hardcore championship. <laughs> the the, the pre-taped stuff with Briscoe backstage. Talk about how he's a man. <laughs> And the, the, the helper comes in with the gown and the pumps and says, you want the crossless panties? You can tell. This is what he thinks of it. This was for Vince and Vince only. He got it. You know he had to get a tremendous kick out of seeing his two flunkies, his two stooges. And freaking evening gowns. And you could see how comfortable Pat Patterson was. You take that to mean whatever the hell it was. But you could tell he enjoyed the hell out of this. Like, he lived for this. Like, this was a moment for him. <laughs> I don't know how Briscoe quite felt about it, but Pat Patterson was right at freaking home, wasn't he? <laughs> the crowd instantly turns on it and shits on it. This is boring. <laughs> it's just booing and catcalling and everything else. Mercifully, in a couple of minutes, here comes Crash Holly, pinning Pat Patterson and becoming the new hardcore champion under the 24-7 rules, and the crowd erupts. So at the end of the day, maybe it was all freaking worth it. Crash didn't beat Kurt Angle in his King of the Rings semifinal match, but he comes right back out a few minutes later, and he's the new 24-7 champion, or not the 24-7 champion, excuse me, the hardcore champion under 24-7 rules, and I think beyond question, we all agree, right, that Crash Holly was the greatest hardcore champion in WWF history. Am I wrong? Please tell me how in the comments section, or please tell me how I'm right. Pat Patterson and Jared Briscoe. Like at the time, you could have went with this company, you could have said, hey, we're going to have Trish and Lita Braun Patty's match. Or we could have Patterson versus Briscoe. I can see Vince, you're right! <laughs> Let me put the two 50 plus year old men in freaking evening coats. Pat Patterson took a pad out. His bra was <laughs> The type of shit totally that would get the internet raging and flaming and being pissed off. <laughs> this shit was train wreck spectacular. <laughs> the, the ladies dominated everything. <laughs> and then the thing about it was, is they actually spent time during King of the Ring building up to this. So this was not just a thing that happened to be in there. They built up to it. Like, King of the Ring is notable for different matches. It seems like every year they happen. They're different stinkers and different dumb decisions. And this is one of them. Like, it's something you don't forget. Uh, the handicap tables dumpsters match between DX and the Dudley Boys all revolved, revolved around that chest of battle, Tori. Would y'all have hit Tori? You know you would have. Um... The finish, well done though, because they've, they've put two members of DX, the Dudleys, have put two members of DX through the tables, and they're about to put Tori through the table, but she ends up getting away and going into the dumpster, and then when the Dudleys go looking for her, she's not in there, they can't see her, and then uh, Road Dog and X-Pac come and hit him in, from behind in the head with the chair. Of course, Bubba Ray, having to be Bubba Ray, says, I'm not going down with one chair shot like Devon. It's going to have to take two for me. And that's how DX wins the match. But it's crazy to me when you look at this, like today's WWE, they would have the Dudleys put everybody through the table and win and then put the other two in the dumpster. Like they totally fucked it up. Instead, what you got here was it's clear and evident that the Dudleys should have won. 
They didn't win, but they still come out of this looking really fucking good, too, because you got the big payoff, Tori going through the goddamn table. Like, that's how it's supposed to be done. The King of the Ring final match was Kurt Angle versus Rikishi. Kurt Angle won in a little under six minutes. And you look at this and you say, that was absolutely the right decision. Kurt Angle was that next man up. Kurt Angle was that dude. Kurt Angle was that guy that you were going to be positioning to be a future world champion. And he would go on to be in 2000. And you think about the world champs in 2000. I think it was only the three guys, right? That went back and forth. It was Triple H, Rock. Triple H, Kurt Angle, Rock. Pretty good year for world champions in WWF. Like, again... If you weren't paying close attention, you didn't miss Austin that much. You really, truly didn't. Uh, which brings you to the main event, which was the six-man tag, The Rock, Taker, and Kane versus the McMahon boys and Triple H. McMahon and Triple H were the team that were defending the championship because Triple H was the WWF champ at the time. And it was, you know, anything goes, whoever wins ends up being the champion. And, you know was the type of match you would expect that involves the McMahons. Like, it's amazing how the McMahon boys, Vince and Shane, seem to get themselves involved in a notable King of the Ring storyline every year, it seemed like now at this point. Uh, but Rock ends up pinning Vince to win the championship, and the crowd goes absolutely electric and crazy. And they were, they were popped, they were excited, and everything else. When you go back and watch this show like this, it is striking, like, just how hot the crowd was for these characters and these stars. It's also striking just how much talent and star power they had at different levels of the card at this time. It's also striking just how different the business is two decades later and how much has it changed. And no matter how much I won't like, I don't like it, it will never be that way again. Never. It will never be this way again. Um, but uh, you had a night where Kurt Angle was anointed as kind of that next man up. The Rock won back the WWF Championship. Like... As a night for some notable stuff. Is it a show you necessarily need to go back and watch again? Probably not. And I could say that I have for most of the King of the Ring shows. But like I said, it's also striking to me that as you think about the King of the Ring concept, it'd be perfectly suited for today's WWE. They don't give a shit about the things that actually matter. They've just become a high, high production value indie fed with crappy camera work. Like an indie fed. So I kind of do wish this King of the Ring concept would go back because I think it would be one of the pay-per-views that everybody would look forward to. I really, really do. But this one here, lots of fun. And of course, Patterson and Briscoe in a hardcore evening gown match. <laughs> what more can you say? That's Attitude Era WWF in a nutshell. <laughs>